actually honestly think it makes their equilibrium off too, right? So yeah, yeah, with yeah. the risk, there's it. absolutely. Yeah. All right, everyone, welcome to Ask Julie Anything September. This, this uh, month, we've got a special guest here, Carol Smea. She's the creator of the Mind Pet Platter. And uh, we brought her on tonight because of tonight's topic. Uh, we're gonna talk all about how your animal's mealware can positively or negatively impact things like their mood, appetite, stress levels. We're gonna talk about the science that supports why you might wanna consider ditching the bowl that you're currently feeding your animal out of. And we're also going to talk about supporting your pet's instinctual drive, which can in turn help them thrive. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Let me know if you can hear us in the chat and a couple housekeeping items before we get going. Um, we'll take Q&A at the end of the session. If you don't mind putting those in the Q&A area, it's at the bottom of the meeting. And also if you don't mind changing your chat settings to everyone so that we can all join the conversation in the chat. I'm your host, Stephanie, and let's rock and roll. Um, Carol, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about why you're on this mission to create better feeding habits for our animals? Well, it's, it's really interesting because one of the areas in the industry that hasn't really been examined at all is how we feed our pets. Uh, what we feed is getting a lot of attention these days, but I had a little experience with my own little uh, Havanese dog, Pip, who used to inhale her, her food in 10 seconds flat, let out a belch that people would have tears streaming down their eyes. It was, it was so loud. And one day I was making her chicken breasts and my daughter said, don't throw those away, give the bits and pieces to Pip. So I put it down on the floor and all of a sudden this dog that used to inhale her food just was totally engaged and enthralled for 20 minutes. And when I told my husband about it, he said, oh my God, Eureka. So that took us on a journey. Um, I have a PhD in psychology and sociology. I was studying human dietary habits and healthier eating. So I translated that to the pet world got to observe um, the instinctive feeding habits in wolves and wild cats, volunteered at zoos and worked with people. And all of this came around to developing the pet platter then. So uh, I owe it to my pet. Our pets give us the best ideas, of course, if we pay attention to them. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, Stephanie, is there something going on with the internet and just wanting to make sure that as far as I can tell we're we're live and everything's okay here Beth just okay. was having a hard time but she rejoined okay um, that's, all right that's quite often the case of where everyone in this community kind of gets started is with our pets kind of showing us the way um I want to talk a little bit if you can about how the way you feed your animal can positively or negatively impact their mood, appetite, and even their stress. Perfect. Well, I think one of the things we first need to do is to look at feeding from a pet's perspective. And I think what I'll do right now is to kind of focus on dogs. And when you look at dogs from an evolutionary perspective, their closest living relative is the gray wolf, and they share over 99% of their DNA. And so uh, we can't look at feeding from our point of view when we are looking at it from the dog's point of view. We have to take into their instinctive feeding traits, which they inherited from the gray wolf. And when you think about it, they were, they had an entirely different feeding ecology. They were living off of a carcass and through evolution and the domestication of dogs, all of a sudden we push them into feeding from a bowl. And when you think about it, it created a whole new source of resource challenges to them because they're not used to being in the confines of a bowl at all. And so there's a couple of areas I, I'd like everybody to think about. One is that they have an, 
important sensory circuit, which helps them guard and protect their resources in the wild. And the extraordinary senses they have are something we can't even begin to relate to. But if you shut those down, you're inhibiting that animal from being who they are instinctively. Another item is the hunt prey instinct. Um, I know everybody says, well, my, my dog is domesticated. I don't have to worry about it. But I love citing a 2016 story out in Southern California where a fisherman lost a one-year-old husky off the back of his boat and they looked forever, couldn't find him and assumed he was dead because the closest land was about five miles away. Six weeks later, they found this dog on an uninhabited island who survived perfectly. And guess what he ate? Rodents and fish. Yeah. And he was never trained to do so, but that hunt prey instinct is always involved. When you're feeding from a bowl or a small contained area, you're basically shutting down that hunt prey instinct altogether. They can't have any engagement with their food at all. And the last one is the survival instinct because they have to be in control of their feeding territory. If you take that away, they're not going to survive in the wild. And so if you have a, a small bowl like this, how does your pet control it? How, how does he know that nobody's gonna take it away? It's impossible. So it creates frustration and stress for them as well. So when you look into the different types of mealware, let's just talk about a few, a few of them. For the bowl, all the food is piled high. There's no engagement or interaction with the food, which leads to what? Food dumping or food relocation so they can engage with their food. If you have a slow feeder, the, the projectiles coming from the slow feeder go into the nose. Your dog's nose is their most powerful sensory asset. And when that's hitting into something, the mucous membrane on the inside swells and is painful. And when food particles get caught with them trying to get the food, it dries it out and they literally lose their ability to smell, which again is stressful, anxiety producing. And then the last one is the lick type mats. They are not designed for the, to uh, help the pet eat. They're designed to inhibit them from eating, but they're not designed to fit the pet's tongue. So what ends up happening, they're smelling the food because for survival instinct, they gotta get to that food, but they can't get to it. So that leads to obsessive compulsive licking, which causes frustration and anger but also it causes physical distress in their neck muscles. I'm working with a veterinarian in that area right now. So these are just examples of be careful of the type of, of product you're feeding your pet from because if it's shutting down who they are as animals, there's going to be negative consequences to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's, I'm going to let you keep talking and then maybe towards the end, we can, we can, we can talk a little bit more, but, um, you know, before we got on and we were, we were talking and I was, I was saying that, you know, before I met you, I, I told a lot of people to literally feed their dogs on yoga mats. Okay. I, know, I know it's disgusting and gross, but I mean, we didn't have we didn't have your, I didn't know about you 20 years ago. And, um, and, and for the longest time, it just, it just doesn't make sense because I grew up on a farm. So I saw all of our farm dogs hunted. So they were constantly bringing rabbits and, and groundhogs and, you know, squirrels and, you know, things like that. I had a husky that would eat mice constantly. Um, and either it went down the hatch and there was no like eating anything, <laughs> you know, she would dive into the snow 
grab a grab a mouse bring it back up throw it in the air and then it just like chomp swallow Uh, but our 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 other our farm dogs that were mostly like you know german shepherd collie crosses or like all different things um well even we even had a couple of beagles when they would come up and you would watch them eat they'd be like lying down and with their hand with their paws like this and like nothing is around them right Right. they're 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 not there's there's lots of space there's lots of ways for them to look around they're not like tunnel vision they're not you know so when you look at when you when you've been lucky enough to look at either you know either coyotes or or dogs that have been hunting or whatever and you watch them eat naturally it's a very different experience than seeing a dog eat from a bowl it's so weird and 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 unnatural yeah you know we've grown up with it we've seen a gazillion commercials and you know but it really is so so far from their their natural their natural habitat right right it's really interesting because when i ask pet parents why do you feed from a bowl there's always that momentary pause and it's like I I never really thought about it and, you know, convenience has driven it. So I agree with you when you talk to trainers who do scatter feeding and things of that sort and being on a farm, that's sort of what people do. But I I don't think um, pet parents ever realized that, you know, the bowl, you're asking your dog, number one, their snout doesn't fit into it. A lot of noses bang up against it and make noise then you're asking them to put their head into a dark hole. And so their vision is blocked, the periphery vision is blocked all together. Then their nose, which is their most powerful sense with over a hundred million sun sites versus our six million, it can't, it can't really engage and smell what's in the bowl at all because it's piled high. But then they're hearing, it's really interesting. They hear at much higher and lower frequencies than we do and at much greater distances. We have a wolf at the zoo who will start howling. And about eight minutes later, this particular siren comes by. And, you know, so the wolf is basically announcing this, the siren's coming by, pay attention. We're all like, how did that come along? You know, we couldn't hear that at all. But when you think about it with their nose and vision stuck in the bottom of the bowl, then they're hearing all of these noises in the background. It creates an anxiety producing situation. And it's really interesting because um, most people feed their pets in a bowl in the corner of a kitchen. That's probably the most threatening thing you could do with an animal because they're blocked in They can't see what's going on around them. They're seeing um, motion in the bowl with the food moving around and reflecting on there. And because they have motion, high motion detection with their vision, it increases anxiety. And then they're sort of blocked in. So it's probably one of the things that causes a lot of finicky eating. The sides of bowls are counterproductive to their sensory seamless input then. Yeah. And I, and I think that for me, before I knew anything about any of this, what made the least amount of sense was when you talk about their nose, Yeah, right? Like, like, it's like, how would we like it if we had to, we had to put our, put our food and smush our face into our food while we're eating? Like, like you can't even like, they, they wouldn't want to be breathing. They wouldn't want to be like, they're, they're inhaling it in their nose. That's, that was the biggest, I think the most obvious thing for me when I was first looking at not, not putting things in bowls for, for animals, because it just didn't make sense to me that, that they're, you know, like, again, if you watch them eat something outside, mm-hmm. they're, they're, this part of their face is fully present right it's not it's not like not like this it's like this yeah oh so their nose is never in anything I mean unless they're maybe eating you know some kind of massive 
animal, like a moose or something, and they're getting into the, into the insides, but right. that's, that's rare. You know, right. that's, that's a, that's a rarity. Right. And, and the same thing with the uh, brachycephalic breeds. I mean, when they're eating from a bowl, you see the food going up into their nose, into their eyes, and it, it's like smashing a meal against their face. I feel so badly for them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so Steph, do you have some questions? I don't wanna keep asking all the questions. Yeah, I do. I wanted to know, like, it's, it's all very logical what both of you are saying that when you see an animal naturally, eating they they typically eat off of the ground or or a flat area um does science support this or is it just something we've been made aware of by watching the animals um well it's really interesting Bes besides their sensory circuit um we know that dogs and pets are fully capable of making food choices on their own and part of the great thing about having a territory, and I guess I'll, I'll just take uh, one of these out with the pet platter, is spreading the food all around like there. It actually allows them to engage with the food because eating is a very excitable, intensive activity for them. And uh, given that they can, uh, they smell, an unbelievable amount there, they can smell a teaspoon of sugar in an Olympic sized pool. And if there's one thing that I hope viewers today walk away with is having total respect for the dog's nose as well as the cat's nose. They view the world through their noses and the more that we help them engage it and respect it, take a look at your pet eating from a bowl or what you're currently feeding from and then fleet feed them on a flat surface and take a look at the difference but our pets are constantly communicating to us we just have to look at what seems to be working what doesn't seem to be working but with the pet platter they will engage and get pulling the food out of here and another thing with the bowl is because it's piled high, they go into gorging. They don't have a choice. They just have to pick all that food up. But because they don't have amylase in their saliva, all that food coagulates going down, hits the, di the stomach and you know causes digestive problems, anything from GDV to food bloat, which isn't actually GDV, but it, it acts like it, it causes stomach distress. So by having them explore and engage in food, like when they opened a carcass and tore meat from it, you're, you're simulating what they did with carcass feeding. And that's the whole purpose of the pet platter. Everything about it is designed to imitate and replicate instinctive feeding behaviors that you see eating out of a carcass. And another important one is the actual shape. By allowing a shape that pets can circle, circling is a very important part in a wild animal's life. This gives them control. Uh, Julie, I'm sure you've seen a lot of footage where you see a wolf or a wild cat carrying a small prey. And then within a half a second, another animal can come in and steal that in less than a second, it's just like a complete blur. So again, knowing their basic instincts, knowing they have to control it, knowing that they can engage on the pet platter on, on an open feeding territory becomes very critical. Um, and the other thing I wanna talk about is licking. We have mm -hmm. scoops on the pet platter, which promote licking and licking releases positive endorphins in their brain. And what this actually resembles is the ends of bones. And so again, we're going back to the carcass, the instinctive feeding, they can pick and choose what they want. It engages them mentally because eating from a bowl chains them 
to something that doesn't engage any of their senses, any of their instinctive drives or behaviors. So you're basically not allowing your pet to be who they really are and who they want to be. Yeah, and I think I think that's a I think that's a really important part. What you just said is that it doesn't allow them to um, uh, eat in the way that they would naturally eat, because when we look at the way, I don't even know how to explain it, but the the um, when I watch the different animals that I have here eat they, even though, you know, you were saying that there's a teaspoon, if you have a teaspoon of sugar and in in an Olympic pool, a dog can smell it out. You'll watch them and it's, it's, it, you assume that everything tastes the same, but it doesn't. So they, they can smell, they can go to the pieces of their, of, of the platter. They can go to the pieces that they want. They can choose what part of their what part of their um their food that they want to eat and some people say well but it's a blend of raw food or it's all the same food and it's like this piece shouldn't taste different than this piece but their 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 smell is so heightened that they are going to smell a piece that's got more liver in it it's impossible for them to be for it to be blended like precisely exactly the same throughout the whole thing so they're they're able to choose what part they want to eat first they like what i think go is going through their heads at one time we can't even compute right like yeah. we can't, it'd be like us trying to pick up a piece of our food and smell each piece you know before like we can't even we can't even possibly understand what happens with their with their sense their scent. Yeah, that's an, ex- that's an excellent point, Julie. And what's so interesting is that the area of the brain that decodes senses is 40 times larger in a dog's brain than ours. So that shows the power of what's going on. And then they also have um, an additional olfactory system in the upper back area of their mouth that goes into the nasal cavity, which is the Jacobson organ. And um, so dogs actually taste with smell. And if your dog sort of comes around his meal and opens his mouth, part of that is he's using all of these sensory components to evaluate what's there. So that's an excellent point to bring up because it's extremely complex. Yeah, for, it is. We I don't think we can really, I don't think we can really understand it other than you know when you're. I mean, I'm I'm trying really hard not to do this, but when you're starving, I mean, this is like an an, an itsy bitsy minuscule, um, not even a comparison, but an idea, right. where you know if we're hungry and we haven't eaten all day. And it's like, oh my God, I'm starving. And you like inhale something. You don't even like, the, like there's no pleasure in inhaling something, you know? And you're like, oh, what did I even eat? I don't even remember what I ate. Um, compared to going out and being able to relax and sit down and not be distracted and, you know, look at your food and taste each piece and, go through different, you know, um, you know, if you go out to a really nice dinner and you're going through different appetizers and you're, you know, it's, it's, you know, what is the difference of that compared to running to a something? And like I said, just like throwing it down the hatch when we think of a dog and, and the other big thing that I wanted to say too, because I'm all about, I'm all about their mental states Mm -hmm. so much. And I always have been, But I always say to people, even with like our supplements and stuff, because that's one of the reasons we, we use such a teeny, teeny amount, because I don't want to change the way their food tastes, right? Like I don't want to add, you know, scoopfuls of stuff into their food so that they're, they're, you know, basically what they're eating is, is herbs, you know, or, or there's so much stuff. 
Um, and I've always said that a dog's dinner is such an important part of their day. Yeah. You know, like it, it's a big deal. And, you know, like just throwing it together and throwing it down or shoving it in a bowl or leaving this, you know, dry kibble in this bowl stuck in a corner for free choice feeding or whatever. It's, it's such a, it's such a disservice to their 24 hours, you know, because they're hunting and then they, they kill their prey and then they're eating. It's, it's almost like a ritual, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of their, of their ability to be happy and to be natural and to, and to enjoy a 24 hour day or, or their day. And we, I think we downplay that. We, we really downplay that so much. You know, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, I'm working with Dr. Jeff Feynman, who I know that you oh, yeah. And we're working on developing a happiness equation to predict what are the core elements that a dog has to have in his life to bring happiness. And I think you bringing up the word happiness brings a whole world open to the pet community because in the wild, they spent 95% of their time hunting, foraging, scavenging for prey all day long. Their whole world revolved around the feeding experience. And yeah. once we took them into the bowl, we, that is their happiness. That is their satisfaction. That is who they are as animals. So I, I'm with you completely spending more time with their meals, making sure you, you know, develop meals where they can sniff, where they can identify foods and enjoy them. We're yeah. bringing happiness into their lives. For sure. And it's a, it's a really wonderful point. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's, um, when we think about what we do in a day, you know, so we wake up in the morning and, you know, with me, if I take out my book and I write about being grateful and then I meditate and then I make myself a tea and then I sit outside and I, you know, so that I have, you know, and then I'm working and I'm engaging with people through Zoom and I'm, you know, going right. outside and I'm, I'm pretty stimulated throughout my day. Right. So when you think of a dog, you know, or a cat, what is one of the one of the most stimulating moments of their day is their is eating mm -hmm. and i think it's really important that that we're looking at the entire experience instead of like you said just what we're feeding them just their diet i mean it's great that we're trying to look at more species oriented foods and things like that but i'm always you know 5 years ago i've been saying species oriented lifestyle right? Like right. what, what is their, what should their lifestyle be like? Not just their diet, but what yeah. should their lifestyle be like? Shouldn't be sitting, you know, you know, a, a dog in a house, there's not a lot of stimulation. He can't just like go over in the corner and open up a book or go on his computer or, or, you know, and he's looking forward to his food. He's looking, you know, it's, it is a, it's a really big, you know, as, as well as his walks and, you know, right. going and playing and engaging with his, with his pet parents and stuff, but it, it is a, it's a highlight. It's a big highlight of their day. And, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't take a lot of time and a lot of energy. You know, I know a lot of people are busy. They're really, really busy, but, you know, to, to get a platter and that, and that platter makes such a, such a impact on their, on their happiness, on their life, on the, on their, on their, which equals their health, right? right. Because it, 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 you can't, you can't separate that stuff. Right. And I, and I think the pet parents like getting involved in their pets meals and preparing, you know, much like they would for their own family, doing it for their pet family as well. And that's why the whole charcuterie board type thing with raw eggs and this and that and the supplements and herbs, it all comes together full circle then. Yeah. Yeah. It ties into what Julie was saying. 
about letting them choose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And even if people can't, even if people don't have the time to, to make it like that so that they, that they can choose, um, you know, like if they don't have time to like put in, I mean, ideally that is like, that's not the best. I mean, there's no such thing as really best and whatever, but just the fact that they can, they can smell it. It's mm -hmm. not stuffed up their nose. They've got space. Then they don't have tunnel vision. It's not creating anxiety, mm -hmm. right? When you, when you look at all of those things, because I try to make it so that every, every type of person in their, in their lifestyle can do what they can do. So, right. and, and do the best that they can do. You know, I, I often say like, you know, soccer moms, they don't even have time to have a bath or, you know, they're you, like, if, if you're, if time is really something that you don't have and you're just, you're, you're purchasing a food that's, you know, already prepared, just right. feeding it on something that allows their natural instinct to take over is hugely mm -hmm. beneficial. It doesn't have to look like, you know, a tray with all of these different things. Like you said, if you can, you know, you can put a, an egg on it and a chicken wing over here and a, and you know, some, you can definitely, if you have the time, you can definitely do that. But that, I don't think that the platter is just to do that. The whole idea of it is to stimulate their natural instincts and allow them to, to engage and eat the mm -hmm. way a dog and a cat is supposed to eat. Right. You know? Right. And it, it could be as much as just pouring goat's milk or bone broth. Um, because with the pet platter also, you can stick it in the freezer and it makes like little ice cream cones right. on a hot day out in the summer. They love it. And it's, it's again, engaging with the food. And I know some people feel like, you know, the bowl, the food is contained and no food is going to go anywhere part of the eating engagement, pets actually push the platter in a position that they feel comfortable with and how they can control it. And I try to tell people, allow your, your dog or cat to move it around because again, that's the control factor, which goes back into that instinctive nature. Yeah. And then it reduces the anxiety. And you said a very important thing. There's so many things in the world and the way pets are being fed that increases anxiety. And a lot of the people who engage with, who have dogs that are really finicky eaters. And I think one person may be on the chat tonight who originally came up at a raw natural conference. And she said to me and my husband, my dog will only eat from my hand. And there is no way your pet platter is ever going to change that behavior. So my husband actually gave her a platter and said, you take this, come back tomorrow. And if it doesn't work, we'll pay you. Okay. <laughs> and it worked. And that was, uh, you said that was me. <laughs> <laughs> her name is Cindy. And I, I just saw her on the chat here. But I use that often because my husband and her just got into this really feverish Yay. argument. And he was like, no, this is going to work for you, I promise. And so um, finicky, for those pet parents tonight who experience finicky eaters, you are blocking the sensory aspect of the feeding process. You're frustrating them. And it's that they can't get the information they need to decode to say, it's all right, I can relax and I can eat comfortably. Mm -hmm. So finicky eating is oftentimes just related to a stressful feeding environment. Open it up so they can engage with their meal. Yeah, finicky eating. And I would also say gorging, like eating too fast. So fin finicky or eating like way, way, way too fast. Right. Oh, and I think that's because they're in this hole. They don't know who's coming to the side. They don't know, you know, so they're like, just like inhaling it, right. you know, trying to try and get it down. So, um, 
I think it is really helpful for, um, you know, dogs that have acid reflux, animals mm -hmm. that, um, well, because they're also, they're, I think they're, I think that if you watch a dog eat out of a bowl, they gulp because they don't really want to stick their noses. They don't want stuff going up their nose. So right. they kind of like gulp it, you know, it, uh, it's, it's just a very unnatural, really unnatural way of feeding anything, dogs, cats, horses, like nothing is built to stick their faces in something to eat. So right. I think it's, I think it's very helpful for, for dogs that have, um, uh, you know, acid reflux and things like that. Well, and, and it's interesting because we actually studied a lot with cats and dogs eating out of bowls. And what we found is because they are hearing all these noises in the background, their peripheral vision is blocked. They don't know if somebody can come in and take it. So they've actually learned to use the lower jaw as pushing it up against the side of the bowl and it acts as a backward conveyor to shovel more food and air in faster. Right. So that conveyor belt actually hurts their digestion and which is why you see dogs oftentimes after bowl feeding pushing their necks up and down to try to get the coagulated food down their throats. Yeah. And so the sides actually are counterproductive to healthy digestion. Yeah, it's, yeah, it is. It, well, it's all part and parcel, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the amount of um, wrong information that we've all received over the years to, to make things on every level, you know, when it comes to animals and, you know, to make it easier for us, right. not what's best with, for them is, is a, is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm, we had a conversation, um, you know, just about my clinic and how, you know, I didn't have, I never had steel tables in any of my exam rooms and, you know, right. I never put an animal on a steel table and, you know, the vets that worked for me, they knew, they knew, I mean, they had to get on their hands and knees with big dogs and maybe sometimes even small dogs if the small dogs didn't want to go on the, on the ottomans and sit with their, with their, so it's like, I think a lot of our feeding strategy with dogs, cats, horses has been, and, and livestock, everything has been out of convenience for people and has, has zero to do what's, what's best for the animal. Yeah. You know, there's one thing I wanted to bring up, especially knowing that that you've been on farms. In all of our studies, we found that uh, wolves and wildcats eat over their carcass. Yeah. yeah. So they're in a convex position. And when dogs and cats eat out of bowls, they go into a concave position because mm -hmm. they're scooping food out of the bowl. Yeah. So you really want your pet in a convex position, much like you do in the wild, because they're picking up smaller pieces of food and bringing it down. If you're in the bowl, it's just scooping it up and shoveling, yeah. gorging that food. Yeah. So the position watching wild animals eat over carcasses is very instructive. Did you Do you see that on the farm a lot as well? Yeah, I mean, I saw that more when I was in BC because where I lived in BC, I lived on a on a ravine that we had six to six to eight, sometimes ten different um, packs of coyotes mm -hmm. that would cross our ravine at any time of the day. So I saw a lot of a lot of coyotes, and definitely, especially if there was more than one, they they stood up to eat on my farm sometimes, but I, I remember them a lot lying down and eating, mm -hmm. but they're still in that position. They're right. still in that position. Like their, their front legs are like this and they're down like that. Right. right? right. So they're, they're pulling it up. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're ripping and tearing and pulling it up. They're definitely not concave. Yeah. And sometimes they're even like 
I remember, um, um, you know, it, it depends too. Like when they first would start to eat it, they'd stick their foot on it and they'd sort of like start to pull it apart when they're standing. Right. And then later, especially when they were chewing the bones and stuff, they'd be lying down. Right. Like eating the rest of it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite interesting. There's, yeah, there's definitely no, <laughs> no, yeah. none of that concave thing. That's for sure. Mother nature knows best, right? Yes. <laughs> For sure, they do. They do, for sure. Uh, you ladies answered my last question, uh, which oh. was how supporting your pet's instinctual drive can help make them thrive. I think we pretty much covered that with the last few minutes of what you said, unless you have anything else to add. Um, do you have anything else? Carol, do you have anything else to add? Uh -huh. You know what, I, I think the key thing is um, to realize that again, and I'm going back to this, please observe how your pet is eating, see what is working and not working for them and um, start paying attention to how they smell, how they engage with their food and one of the interesting uh, things that you may want to do one day is to simply go to a zoo to see what carcass feeding is all about. Mm -hmm. I think it's very instructive to see wow. how wild animals literally consume the high chew bones like Julie was talking about, that when you see the amount of engagement and mental stimulation that animals receive from this, it makes you want to do more for your pet. And it doesn't take a lot of time, but just observing what makes them happiest, what makes meal time really fulfilling for them, it doesn't take a lot of time, just a little thought to make some tweaks and it makes a world of difference. And when your dog or cat looks up and licks their lips and just says, this was great, you, you know that you've given them the opportunity to live their best lives. Yeah. And I, and I also, um, you know, I like always using comparisons and stuff. And, you know, I was comparing about what, what's it like when you're rushing you know, mm -hmm. and in, in eating and stuff, the, the, what we're talking about tonight is our tooth are, it really, um, bridges that mental, emotional health and the physical health and how they're, they're, they're really one and the same, because when you're, when an animal is stressed or when we're stressed, and we're eating, we can't digest properly because our you're when you're super stressed and, and you create anxiety, you're creating almost that fight or flight. Right. When that fight or flight happens, your digestive system isn't thinking about digesting, it's thinking of fighting or running. So right. it's, it isn't it isn't the proper hormones, the proper stimulation, the proper enzymes, the proper everything just doesn't happen when they're in that when they're when their bodies are in that state mm -hmm. so so when you're when you're uh, you know I, and and I'm not trying to be you know um weird or anything but I remember so many times when, when dogs have collars on and they would be eating out of a bowl and oh, their yeah. collars would be like banging the bowl or they're eating and and they're they're the tags on their collars and stuff are, are clinking together or, or banging together and you watch it and it, and you're thinking, okay, that dog is thinking, is anybody coming to mm. eat my food? Do I need to protect my food? Do I need to like gorge and swallow my food? Do I need to take my food to a different area? But their, their hearing is being, you know, overwhelmed by this clinking sound and stuff. And when we, when we're thinking about where, how we're feeding our dog and what we're feeding our dogs on or cats on, I think it, it really is important to, to, to merge those two together. 
happiness and if they're stressed they aren't digesting they're not they're not their their bodies aren't in a state where they're where they're set up to eat mm -hmm. and 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 digest you know their esophagus is is probably not working correctly their digestive enzymes aren't working co correctly i think it's i think it is it's it's very much about their happiness but it's also very much if they're not happy and they're in a place of stress it's going to affect their physical health because they're not going to be digesting their food correctly you know it's interesting more and more people i've been talking to are talking about if a pet parent is stressed don't make the meal for your pet at that time yeah because your dog or cat will basically see that sunset and it creates stress for them as well and so this I, I love the fact that you brought that up because it's it's so meaningful. Our mental state and our pet's mental state are connected. And in order to make, optimize that meal time, make sure you come into it with a positive attitude and make them feel a part of the process, which again, reduces that stress level. Yeah, I have, a, I mean, this is completely off topic, but I've always had an issue with, um, um, I've, I've always been sort of the outsider around um, fasting, right? I'm not a, I'm not a big, I'm not a big, I'm not a big supporter of fasting dogs mm -hmm. um, unless the whole family fasts. So I, 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 I think fasting is great. I think it's great for people. I think it's great for animals, but I don't think it's great for animals if, if the entire, if their family is not also fasting, because it's, it's a, it's, you know, when, when we're talking about preparing our food, it's a family thing, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden right. one day a week, we're deciding, okay, you're not part of our family, but they're still smelling it. They're still, they're, you know, their, their, their bodies are smelling our food and that immediately starts like with their smell how how strong their smell is it immediately starts their their digestive enzymes to start working and their body's thinking that they're going to eat and then everybody sits down to eat and the dog isn't eating so mm -hmm. you know if, if you're feeding it a bone you know or something like that that's 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 still different right but when you're, when you're full on not fast when you're when you're full on fasting them i i I'm not a, you know, I'm not saying that, that it's, it's a horrible thing, but I've just done a big, I'm not a big supporter of it. Uh, I, I think it's very confusing for them to not to, to fast when everybody else is eating. I, I'd love to get your opinion about one other thing, because we've never talked about this before. And this is a question we get from people all the time, raised feeders. Do you mind me asking what your point of view is? Yeah, I think because I'm so, um, my whole life, I've been very um, uh, individualized, right? Like when I grew up on a rescue, my mom sort of worked with every, she had to, because they had, we had some pretty intense dogs, but um, she kind of worked with every dog differently. So at my clinic, I kind of did that as well. So I am not a big um, supporter of it unless there's um, arthritic mm -hmm. or issues where it's painful for them to, to bend and eat. Because then you're back into that, yeah, it's not natural for it to be high up. Right. But it's also, unless you're feeding them, unless they're good to like be able to lie down and eat, it they're rushing to eat because mm -hmm. they're in a position where it hurts. I mostly see that in older dogs, older, larger dogs that have um, um, hip dysplasia, mm -hmm. some kind of um, chronic vertebrae disease. Uh, sometimes with torn cruciate ligaments, 
So when you're in a when you're in a um, in a situation where you have a big dog mm-hmm. and they're hurting when they eat because right. it's hard for them to be in that position, then I think it's not um, cardiomyopathy, right? Mm-hmm. Even is another one because when they're leaning down, their their hearts are enlarged, so their hearts push forward, right? right. When they're in that position, so mm-hmm. I still am like. It's got to be a platter. It can be raised, but it has to be platter. Cannot be in a bowl, a billion mm-hmm. percent. Or put it on a yoga mat and have them so that they're not sliding. Because right. that's, that's the big thing. When dogs get older, so basically, I think what I'm saying is that I I I'm I support it with larger, older dogs because I've actually mm-hmm. seen them enjoying their food more because they don't mm-hmm. hurt. I've seen dogs right. raising them or dogs aren't, are being picky. You put a platter on a raised thing and all of a sudden they're like loving their, loving their food again. Um, or, right. or they're sliding. So mm-hmm. if it's a big dog and you've got them on your kitchen floor, even with a platter, but their right. legs are starting to splay out because they're trying to, to lean down and eat then you have a choice put them on a yoga mat put it on the thing see if that changes if it does it's just what you said watch your dog yeah watch your dog is your dog different your old big dog different or your old little dog whatever does it eat differently does it look more comfortable when it's when it's raised you know I, yeah, no, I agree with you. And um, we get this question so much on our info site. And the one thing that we noticed, and this is even when um, uh, young cubs get their first sort of uh, quarter of a carcass or something like that, nobody ever elevates the carcass. So you know, it's right up against them. They're, they're typically eating over. Yep. And, I, and I think for the most part, and your examples from the farm as well, um, because wolves and dogs have incredibly strong muscles in their necks. When you think of playing tug of war with a dog, it's amazing how much they, you know, they could rip your arm off at some point in time. Yeah. It's so strong. But just watching for, you know, aging, there are medical conditions where, you know, we thoroughly agree. My only concern was um, the Purdue study showed that elevating feeding, especially among large and giant breeds, can sometimes increase the risk of bloat. And from some of the information I've received is if, if you get a raised feeder and you start to notice that there's increased gas with your dog, it could be a sign that bloat is then developing. But for the most part, in the wild, eating over and controlling a carcass is is optimal. So I, sure. I agree. A hundred percent. But yeah. but that, I think what I'm saying is that each individual and I, I look at every single case differently. Right. Like every single animal is is different. And when you also, when I say raised, I don't mean like here. They're mm-hmm. still they're still bending over. Like all right. all my patients that I that I recommended that it wasn't off the ground. Like they're eating like <laughs> you don't. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not so high that they aren't so that they're they're like you know chin high to it. They're right. still bending over it and bending down. They're just not having to go all the way down like to the ground and that's a great point to bring up to pet parents because i think when i see some of these pictures it's like the you yeah know. no that's 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 yeah no 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 no, not not like that you're just you're taking the you're taking the um the stretching part or the or the the um the other thing too I want to mention is is when you look at wolves proportionate in their proportion to mm-hmm. their legs compared to 
some dogs like St. Bernard's and things where I, I, it's almost like their necks aren't even as long as their front legs. Right. You know, like it's almost like they're disproportioned. It's right. not their bread, their bread to have, they're just bred a little odd. You know, yeah. you watch them and it's like, oh, that's interesting. It's almost like you can't reach the floor. Right, right. You know, like I've, I've actually seen that, you know, with, with things. So, you know, and I, in every single animal is different. Every single disease is different. So when I think of raised bowls, I think of it for specific diseases, not as a prevention for something. It's once they're there, once they're, mm -hmm. it's, once they're in a situation where it's more difficult for them to bend down than not, then your mm -hmm. risk versus benefits, you know, from, from there, but still not, not chin height. It's just right. taking the, it's just taking a little bit of that pressure off of their spine. So that's just right. not flat on the ground. But then I've seen some, some dogs do better. You get them to lie down, mm -hmm. you know, you get them to lie down and then you feed them lying down. But some dogs won't lie down if you're feeding them on a on a on a ceramic floor, right? You know, right. Mm -hmm. I, I I have a big I have a big issue with that 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 I have a really big issue with. I don't think that any dog should be should be eat, sit, standing on slippery floor or eating whether they're eating up down. It doesn't matter. It, that's super unnatural to me. They're usually on grass or they're on. You know, like they're they're out in a field, they're not standing on an ice rink or standing on, you know, something that slippery to eat. They need to really be able to position themselves and much like they do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so well, I don't know if I can just throw in one more quick thing that sort of popped into yeah. my head. Yeah, for sure. Um, dog and cat cancer rates are doubling every year. And um, I think one of my goals is uh, with the pet platter, we do independent third party testing on our material to guarantee that it's food safe, nothing can leach from it. It's non porous, so you never have to worry. But I, I had one event take place, which I always like to share with different audiences. And one of those is that a woman came in at an event and said, I have a question for you. I uh, will go out jogging with my dog. We come back. My dog is desperate for water. I have a water bowl on the main floor. And then I have another one on the upper level floor. And he'll always run up to the first floor first to see if there's water. And only then will he come down. Why? And I said, check to see if you have a ceramic bowl. If there's a hairline crack in there, your dog is probably smelling or, and or tasting toxins. And she was like, oh my God, I never thought about that. So going back to paying attention to what your dog is doing, they're communicating with you, is just bear in mind what you're serving your pets from. Make sure they're not coming from a place where there is no control, where it's not tested for safety, where it's, it's not leaching, because it's probably the most important thing. You're feeding your pet off of this twice a day, their snout and their tongues are constantly on it. And it's just a way that we can start reducing cancer rates among our pets as well. And that's, that's of course, with what you feed them and how, what you feed them from as well. So I just wanted to tell that story because it's another way of your pet is always talking to you. A hundred percent. It's very, very true. It's just, we always, on Adored Beast and Stephanie, and anytime I'm writing or anything, I'm always talking about being conscious. Right, like just be being aware, paying attention and being aware is such a massively huge, important, proactive place to be for our own health, our family's health, our animals' health. You know, we we are um, so distracted 
that I always say that, you know, we love our animals so much that we will, we'll, we'll do anything that we can for them. And I think that that's a big, a big part is them making us slow down and become more um, observant, observant and in the moment and paying attention. And, you know, it's really good for us to be like that. And it's in it, and it can, it can show us and, and um, bring attention to things much sooner and before they're really, really sick so that we can help derail stuff. Right. 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 Yeah. It's an excellent point. Just be observant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Do we, uh, do we have time for a few Q and A here? Sure. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. there, was, there was one that I have to bring up from our friend Jay Kennedy, the two, one of the two crazy cat ladies. Oh. She said, when we're feeding our, our animals, does color matter? Um, absolutely. Um, uh, both dogs and cats have different color spectrums than we do. They have more rods than cones, which uh, limit the colors they see. So, um, and especially if you have a visually challenged dog, um, basically they can see blue, yellow, and red is seen as either brownish or grayish. Um, the great thing with the pet platter is we use colors. So the, the color that your pet is first served on, they adopt as their own personal feeding territory. And the great thing is they'll respect the color of another dog's. So it eliminates food aggression and food stealing. And if you have a visually challenged dog, use a dark pet platter on a light floor and a light color platter on a dark floor and visually challenged dogs will be able to see more the perimeter of where their food is. And we have daycare facilities that use this now for visually challenged dogs. And it, it really helps and reduces the frustration and stress of trying to constantly find where the food is. It, it adds that visual context for them. Yeah. And I know we didn't talk about cats and whiskers, but it's a huge one, right? It's, you know, the, the, whisk, the whisker fatigue and yeah. Julie, I'm sure you have more stories than I do that with some cats, the sensory organs at the base of the whiskers, yeah. the constant hitting, it can be so painful that it causes cats to literally cry. The pain can be so bad and, and they'll, they'll lose their appetite appetite or they'll throw up I I the first time I ever it was like 22 years ago probably and I was dealing with a cat that was diagnosed with they thought was IBD and then they thought was allergies and then they thought was food allergies and just vomit constant vomiting oh, wow. and um it was the very first time that I ever even thought about it and um the they were a separated couple and I was mm. sitting down and I, I took a lot of time on, with my patients, right? Like the first, first, my first consult was at least an hour and a half long. So mm. we've been working on this cat and we would get it better and certain things were helping and certain things weren't. And then finally I said, Can, would you, would your, would your partner, even though they they were divorced, would, would he come in? Because when the cat would go to his house, it would hardly vomit. But when it would come to her house, it would vomit all the time. Yeah. And so he came in and I was going through everything. Like it's exactly the same, same water, same. What kind of floor cleaners do you use? You know, like it was like <laughs> they were on trial. I was like, I, there's got to be something <laughs> here. He fed the cat from a saucer uh, and she fed the cat from a bowl. Right. And I was like, wow okay, let's, let's take a look at this more. And my, maybe it was even 25 years ago. And it was a very, it was my very first aha moment. It's like, okay, every time that cat sticks its face in that bowl, its whiskers are being pushed back. So I started talking to people about like depth perception and, and, 
um, and nausea and things mm-hmm. like that, like what all what, what all could happen. So then I started trying it with a whole bunch of other vomiting cat patients, which is a which was a big one. Yeah. Um, and I'm telling you, my goodness, I, I would say 60 to 70 percent of them, it stopped it. It, it stopped it stopped so whether they were gorging fast because they didn't want to do that whether their stress levels were up really high whether their cortisol levels were really stressed out whether it was whisker fatigue or or you know like i said depth perception or you know almost like motion sickness in a way when they're because they're so so phenomenally sensitive and when we talk about dogs and in their in their noses and stuff like cats whiskers are we just don't even have a clue you know so i think it's it's massively important for cats to never be fed in bowls you yeah. know my and my cats water dishes are are big glass um um baking baking trays that are only about that high and really really big so they don't have to t- nothing they don't touch anything when they're when they're drinking from it yeah. so yeah it it's a it's a it's a very very big issue with cats yeah that's one of the questions here that's been asked a couple times is what you both suggest for feeding water so julie yours is like a, a pyrex like lasagna dish yeah like the glass. glass one yeah, yeah for my cat for my cats yeah not, not for my dogs. My dogs have big stainless steel, but wide, really wide, yeah, wide bowls. So they, their faces don't go in it at all. And I'm just super anal about it always being topped, topped right up. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So my cats, my cats have a a much a much wider, a much wider space mm-hmm. where they can drink. Carol, do you have a suggestion? Um, that is a very good question. I would say the best thing to do is to get a material that you know is not going to leach. And even with stainless steel bowls, um, if they come from China, yeah, no, the one <laughs> thing, um, people don't understand that, um, there are different fluids that are used in the molding process that can be very toxic. If you don't have a manufacturing firm that uses good manufacturing process where everything is controlled, yeah. you don't know what's in there. So um, I would suggest to be very careful, look at the material. The glass bowl is definitely an option. Make sure- but not, that- someone said Pyrex, it's definitely not Pyrex. That's yeah. what I was, it's, it's glass. It's yeah. actually very beautiful. It's blown glass. Yeah. <laughs> There's not, so, yeah, there's no, there's no, or make sure thing, nothing's like coated, you know, yeah. like easy to clean. The second you, you read easy to clean or, you know, food falls off in the dishwasher or whatever, that's massive alarm bells going off with, with what, what that could be leaching in, in the, in the, um, coating that they put on even even stainless steel like when you look at stainless steel pots and stuff um if it if it cleans off easily then there's something else there's something else on it yeah. but you're right you have to be you have to be anal about about what's what's in it, mm-hmm. it it's, that's kind of you know well, everywhere. And, and we're we're going to be coming out we have um plans to come out with a water bowl, which will be announced to Julie when we, (laughs) and we'll definitely send one to you uh, because we realize with the pet platter, everybody's looking for a safe material. So we're working on that. And, um, but like Julie said, just stay, just because it's stainless steel doesn't mean, everybody thinks of surgical steel. Those are two different manufacturing processes altogether. Yes. So um, just pay attention to what it is and contact us and, and we can help if you need some feedback on that then. Yeah. That's fabulous. There's and, two questions. Oh, sorry. But go. No, no, go ahead. There's, there's two questions here that um, are asking something similar. 
They see that the platter is fairly shallow. Um, can you talk about feeding things like liquid bone broth or, or kefir, liquid sort of additions yeah. to the diet? Absolutely. Uh, the pet platter is capable of holding a great deal of moisture and liquids. And I think the small platter can hold up to three quarters cup liquid and the large one over a cup and a quarter. I'm not quite sure. But the other thing is when you uh, are preparing the meal and spreading the food around, you can create like little circles which will contain the liquids within there. And uh, like I said before, you can also freeze it and then serve food as well and promote the licking involved in it as well. So a lot of people will use the food to create little areas where some of the bone broth or goat's milk can go into, but it does hold quite a bit. Fabulous. Um, Tina has a question. Can you talk about why perhaps a licky mat would not be comparable to something like the platter? Um, the licky mats are uh, designed in such a way to inhibit the dog or cat from getting it. It has like very sharp corners or odd shapes where the tongue can't fit and get into it. So with the pet platter, it was specifically designed so the cat or dog could get literally every speck of food to make it a successful meal experience rather than a frustrating one. Um, but the other thing is when, when you're feeding from a small area like that as well, the pet stands very rigid because the repetitive licking is taking place. And so it's, it's not a relaxed state. They don't have control over it. And sometimes the material breaks and specks of food will get caught in there. And then, especially with a cat's tongue, and I'm sure Julie knows this more than anybody, they're very rough. And so I'm not quite sure what those rough tongues do on, on material like that. Julie, would, would you know? Well, I wouldn't, I shouldn't say I wouldn't use, um, I don't think it's natural. That's the, that's the thing with me. So anytime that there's going to be like remnants left over or that they have to really, really, really lick to get, to get something off. If you think about what that would be in the wild, it'd be a bone, right? Like if they had to really yeah. like pull and lick and, and, and it would be a, bo a bone. So that's, that's smooth, right? right. You're not going to get anything abrasive, you know, I mean, fur, fur is abrasive. So they're licking the fur, but they don't lick the fur. They, they'll, they'll pull it off, mm -hmm. you know, and tear it off. <clears throat> they eat it, but um, some of those mats are very abrasive. And, yeah. and, I, and I, and I, and I think it's like you said, it sets them up for failure to, to get like, they can't, they can't get it all off. Well, and what's so interesting is the dog's tongue is very soft. And so I'm, I'm not quite sure the feeling, and, and it goes back to what Julie said, it's like, we don't fully understand how they're interpreting or feeling things, but it has to be hard on the tongue going across that hard material in a repetitive manner. So yeah. yeah, they're just they're not they're not they're not um dogs or cats aren't developed to like you wouldn't see a dog or a cat go and lick a like a really sharp rock. Like a like a rough like a rough rock. And if you do that usually means that they're especially cats if they're licking cement and things like that, I've always said that they're usually anemic, but, um, the, 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 it, it's not natural. I think it, it, it causes them stress because they're trying to get to it and they can't, they can't full. And I think that they would probably still smell it 
And I think it is too rough on their tongues, cats and dogs. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And it goes back, is it a natural action that you would that, see? In that's the what I always say. Is that yeah. something that they would be naturally eating off of? Is that, is that, is that, would that, is that mimicking something in the wild? Because right. even if it's on dirt, let's say it's on dirt, they're eating on dirt, or they're eat, they are eating on a rock, it's not they're they're able to pick it up it's not sticking on it mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's not like it's right. not like it's stuck on it's not it's not, it's not stuck on it like in, in an abrasive way right i right. think that's a that's a good takeaway for the session is just be aware of what would be natural for your pet and and watch them and and they'll show you the what they need right or um, watch them and and like carol said watch you know if you can't if you know just watch wildlife shows I mean, right that's a that's a that's yeah. a just google just google you know a, a wolf pack eating something or a cougar pack eating some or a cougar group eating something or you know in the wild and just watch how they eat that's watch a great what, idea watch what they do yeah. Uh, That's a great one, idea. <laughs> can I ask one more question here before we sign yeah. off for the evening? Sure. Um, a couple of the attendees are curious how you both feel about uh, pet fountains. Oh, water fountains? Yeah, for pets. Have you used one? Well, they do. I mean, I know that that I guess it depends on what kind of water you're using, making sure that the that the the circulating water stays clean, that all those little pipes stay clean. I've seen some of them get pretty um, moldy, you know, like like build up a lot of mold. Um, you know, if your animal really likes them, I don't think it's so long as you're using really clean water. And again, are are the are the pipes, you know. Are they safe? Are they food safe? Are they, do they have toxins in them? What's the bowls made out of? What, you know, what's your, what's your water circulating through? I think all that is really important. And if, yeah. if your pet doesn't really like going there for water, or if there's hesitancy, like Julie was saying before, observe their behavior, then you know that they could be smelling toxins or something that they know is not healthy for them. So their behavior is going to be telling you a lot whether or not that's working for them. I mean, I know cats have fun with them. So I know a lot of people that are, I knew a lot of people that use them to try to get their cats to drink more because they had fun with them. They seem to be interested in yeah. them, right? Because it's, it's coming out and you know, I know that the cat that was just on top of me with the minute I'm brushing my teeth, she's in <laughs> splashing the water all over the place. But I think that's more from a from a from a perspective of they're bored, you know, and or is it fresh water, right? Like it like right. is it is it fresh water coming out and they want really fresh water and that hasn't been sitting in a bowl for a while. I don't know. It, it, it you would just have to really be sure. I think it's fine so long as the the materials on them have been checked out, including the little pipes and stuff that, that the fountain's being used with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was super informative. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Carol, for being our guest tonight. Thank you for both for sharing all your info. Julie, thank you for all you contribute to the pet community. I know you have a huge fan club out there and you do so much. Thank you. It's been an honor to speak with you today. Yeah, well, thank you so much because I think that, you know, until you started making these, a lot of, it was frustrating for me because I would always tell people put, like, put it on a platter, like yeah. go buy, go buy a, 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 a like a human meat platter and put put it on the platter because I just couldn't stand and when I first met you and I saw that I'm like oh my gosh this is like incredible that that someone's actually making these things and 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 talking about the benefits and how you know how 
unfortunate it is for us to be making our animals eat so unnaturally. Oh, thank you so much. It means a great deal to me. And I hope we get to do more in the future. Yes, for sure. And I'm visiting you in Canada. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're thank welcome. you, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank Bye. you, Carol. Thank everybody. you, Julie. Bye-bye, everybody.